On All Saints Day, we face head-on into something that we'd rather turn away from, death itself. Yes, All Saints Day has different meanings in different Christian traditions, but in most Western Protestant churches, it's a Remembrance Day. We don't usually parse out the differences between All Saints Day and All Souls Day and All Hallows Eve. We kind of lump them all together on November 1 or the closest Sunday and use that day to remember and honor and grieve those of our faith communities who have died and who are now in the great cloud of witnesses. We choose to revisit our loss and ponder our mortality. Now, some of us might wish for a more pleasant theme, seeing that we're in the middle of multiple deadly pandemics and our nation is in the midst of one of the most anxious and potentially even violent presidential elections in our memory, Lord have mercy. Nevertheless, today we choose to enter into the shadows. Yes, there is resurrection, thank God, but this isn't Easter. Today we need to remember and feel the pain of death. So even though the narrative lectionary stays on track today, we are given a story that will help us in this regard. Elijah the Tishbite, prophet of God. I mentioned last Sunday that once Israel chose to be ruled by kings, that God had to grab another tool out of his heavenly toolbox, the prophet of God, to keep the kings in line. When we were still back in Genesis, I made the comment that the whole biblical narrative is God running interference on God's people. The people veer off this way or that since God gave them free will. And every time they drift into danger of losing themselves or destroying themselves, God runs interference to steer them back on track. Now that Israel is a monarchy and their kings, by and large, are more power-hungry and narcissistic than they are humble servants of God, God stays very busy running interference. God calls prophets into duty again and again to bring evil kings back in line. Some prophets had a harder job than others. I would not have wanted the job of Elijah the Tishbite, sent to be a moral compass for the likes of King Ahab. Read the books of First and Second Kings sometime. You see a pattern. Every king keeps getting worse. Our story is from First Kings 17, but in the chapter right before that, it says that King Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. Well, King Ahab was Omri's son. It says about Ahab, he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of previous kings, he began to serve Baal and worship him. Ahab did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. What does an angry God do? send in Elijah the Tishbite. The king received Elijah, who delivered this message, not the greatest motivational speech ever. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And he turned and walked out of the palace. And then, take a look. I never cease to be amazed at some of the crucial details that get preserved in Scripture. When Elijah walks out on Ahab, God tells him where to go hide from the king. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Kareth Ravine is a name that is doubled for emphasis. Kareth means a cutting or a gorge or a torrent bed, 
and a ravine is the same thing, a, a rainwater gully. In Hebrew, the word is wadi. Wadis are not spring-fed rivers. They are channels in the desert. They have water in them only in rainy season. Most of the time, they're dry. So Kareth Ravine is not just a ditch, it's a ditchy ditch. So God, the great provider, as soon as Elijah proclaims there will not be rain for years, sends Elijah to a ditch, a wadi. Go there, God says, and drink from the brook. And to add to the unlikely story, ravens, birds that normally scavenge and take food from others, are going to be Elijah's food givers. Well, that arrangement, as scripture notes, didn't last real long. The wadi dried up. Surprise, surprise. So here's God's backup plan to provide for Elijah. Go to a widow in Zarephath, and she will supply you with food. A widow was like a human wadi, economically speaking. She only had resources when it rained, as it were, when good fortune or good people would send it her way. Without property or inheritance to leverage, it, it was just her own ingenuity and luck and good weather that she could feed her family. So, weeks or months into a drought, God sends Elijah to a widow with a dependent son. And Elijah asks her to feed him. And even though she only had the dregs of a barrel remaining, she fed him. And we're told her jars kept auto-refilling with flour and oil. She kept feeding him and never ran out. Now, this is more than just another miracle story. It's not written to prove to modern rationalists that God can conjure up flour and oil on the spot. No, this is about God's invitation to us to step into the shadows that we might know the grace and mercy of God, to put ourselves in places of need and dependence and grief and despair and to face even the threat of death, to go where we are called and obey God's commands as if our lives depended on it. Well, the story goes on, and the widow must do precisely what Elijah does, to keep walking toward death, toward grief, toward need, and trust that God's impulse toward life will show up. Her only son died. Her emotional, social, and economic security died. But then, as we heard, life showed up. One of a handful of resurrection stories in scripture. Again, this is not here to prove or even suggest that God can or will raise the dead when needed. This story and others like it do not deny the pain and agony and inevitability of death that we all face in one way or another. No, they are invitations to go where God is going toward life. This is the trajectory of God's activity in the world toward life. Death remains with us. The finality and unfairness and raw pain of death remains. But God's love transcends all that. God's love and provision puts it all in perspective. If we trust God enough, to let ourselves sit in that state of need. In a few moments, we will hear the names read aloud and see the faces of those at Park View who died in the last 12 months. And I think we're all going to be hit once again with a wide range of emotions, from gratitude and love to deep sorrow 
and grief and very possibly anger. This is hard stuff. There's no denying that. Grieving is hard. Living is hard. Being an American right now is hard. There's so much death all around us. The invitation from God today is to not lose ourselves in that, to, but to name our hope in the God who is pointing us toward life, the God who is leading us toward life and provides the food that we need for this journey, for the grieving journey, for this grievous journey. We are not alone. Even beside a wadi or at the mercy of ravens, even in the house of the poor and destitute, we are not alone. God is pointing toward life. You remember some of the phrases we just sang uh, moments ago in Give Thanks for Life? Mortal we pass through beauty that decays. Thanks for the love by which our life is fed, a love not changed by time or death or dread. For hope that like the grain lies in darkness does its life retain in resurrection to grow green again. Hallelujah.